Okay, thank you, Katie. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Kay. Thank you for joining me uh, for this air sensory integration conversation number two on Praxis, and we're meeting on June 27th, 2018. If you were at the first um, ASI conversation, you already are familiar with how the how the session will go. And if you weren't, uh, basically, I'll do a short presentation that will review and add to some of module one, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. So I will likely only take about 20 minutes to present, and then the rest of the time, you can feel free to ask questions either by typing them in the chat box or by unmuting your mic and asking me directly, and either one is fine by me. All right, uh, sound okay? And if everybody could simply um, type OK or something else in the chat box, I will know that you are here and you can hear me just to be sure. Excellent. And I'm just waiting for Ivy. OK, great. Thank you so much. All right, so we're going to get started. And let me say right off the, the top that what I'm going to do is a combination uh, of this session and the next session, which will happen in July. And over the course of those two sessions, we're going to cover Praxis, which will be today, and then sensory reactivity next time. And sensory reactivity you might be more familiar with as sensory modulation or over and under responsiveness or something like that. So this is kind of a two-part uh, deal. Each one can stand on its own, however. So today our main topic is going to be praxis. So Jean Ayers in uh, 1985 said that praxis is the ability by which we figure out how to use our hands and body in skilled tasks like playing with toys, using tools including a pencil or fork, building a structure, whether a toy block tower or a house, straightening up a room, or engaging in many occupations. A more contemporary idea of praxis is that it is the ability to conceptualize and organize novel actions. And all of those words in that definition are pretty important. So, Conceptualize um, is shorthand for thinking up or ideating or initiating an idea. And organizing is how to figure out how to approach or address a motor action. And that kind of corresponds with motor planning, which we'll um, get into more in a few minutes. And then a novel action, not just any old action, but a novel action is actually required for uh, a task to a motor task to actually qualify as being um, in the realm of praxis. So we know that um, we differentiate novel activities, in other words, ones that are new or we're not totally familiar with, from habitual actions that don't require planning, things like walking or changing positions. So we're going to focus on the idea of novel actions today. All right, so there's um, a number of steps in praxis, and for some of this, uh, some of you, this might be a review. For others of you, it may be um, a, something that's a little bit new. The first step in praxis is ideation, and ideation is coming up with an idea of what it is that you want to do motorically. It is um, more of a cognitive and perceptual activity than an actual motor activity at the beginning. And you'll see as we go through the steps of praxis that um, it becomes more and more motor mediated. But when we think about praxis, we think about it starting with our cognition and our perception. Motor planning is the next step of praxis. And that is coming up with a plan or uh, a means to execute a physical activity. 
And motor planning, again, is associated with unfamiliar motor activities as opposed to habitual or familiar ones. So we're, what we're doing is we're activating both our brains and our bodies and figuring out a plan to engage in skilled motor action. We can contrast this idea of motor planning with a novel action with um, reflexive actions, which are centrally programmed and don't require any planning, things like swimming, stepping, rolling, grasping, sitting, crawling, things that we don't spend any time really thinking about even subconsciously. Also, once we learn a skilled motor activity and it becomes what we call second nature or we're totally familiar and have mastered it, it no longer falls in the realm of motor planning. What we're really focusing on, and if you think about what we're doing therapeutically with kids in sensory integration, we're very much thinking about new and novel actions or skill tasks that a child may already know how to do but there's novel conditions. So that may be that they're doing it with a different set of equipment in a different environment at a different speed um, with another uh, child or adult. So it's changed up in some way that qualifies it as a novel motor action. We also really wanna consider the client's ability to generalize from one motor task to another. And we'll come back to that as we move through the presentation. Okay, so the third step is execution, which is the engaging in a motor act. So in this case, um, the child has come up with an idea that he wants to kick a soccer ball. He then comes up with a plan. And, and most of this is happening subconsciously, not in our conscious mind. We're not doing self-talk and saying, I would like to kick the ball. Um, but he's come up with a plan for how to do that as the ball is moving. And now he's putting sequences of actions together to actually shift his weight, lift his left leg, and make contact with that ball to kick it. What happens after those three main steps are feedback and feed forward. So Feedback and feed forward both provide additional information so that we can further engage in a motor activity. Uh, feedback is used while we're learning an action and it provides us knowledge of how we performed and what the results were. So for example, if this kid is cutting Play-Doh and he finds that he's come up with this uh, idea that he wants to cut the snake in half and he's come up with a plan for how to do that. He's stabilizing with his left hand. He's grasping the cutting implement with his right hand and he goes to cut it, but he's not pushing hard enough or his body is in, in a non-optimal position. The feedback piece is going to tell him that and say, hey, oh sure. Uh, I'm not sure how to increase my voice, Ivy, but I will try. Give me just a second. Um, I am as loud as I can be given the system. Is there a way that you can turn up your volume? And is anybody else having difficulty hearing me? Okay, so Ivy, um, you might um, try raising raising the volume on your end. And do um, respond in the comments and let us know if it doesn't improve, okay? All right, so I'm gonna go back to feedback. Um, which provides us with knowledge about our, how we're performing and the results of it. It also enables us to update our motor plans. And feed forward is similar, but we can use feed forward to, um, to anticipate and start to predict what's going to happen with this motor plan and the subsequent execution that we've come up with.
so a few things that are particularly relevant to praxis. The first one is that it's actually differentiated from motor skill. Now praxis definitely has to do with motor activity, but it's not the same as motor skill. It is more of a cognitive and perceptual function. And one way that I think of it is that when um, we think about motor, pure motor, we typically think about um, qualities like strength, endurance, um, range of motion of a limb if we're engaging in a motor activity. So very kind of concrete and cut and dried aspects of how we use our body, our muscles, joints, and connective tissue and um, musculoskeletal system to engage in any kind of physical activity. When we think about praxis in contrast, we also think about this idea of coming up with an idea and coming up with a plan and executing that plan. So it's a much uh, richer and deeper concept than motor skill. Although motor skill is necessary to execute for the execution phase. Um, and the basis for dealing with the physical environment in an adaptive way is another way of looking at what is praxis. So when we're uh, engaged with um, any environment, whether it's a community environment, a home environment, a school environment, what we wanna see is that <clears throat> our clients are actually exhibiting adaptive responses within that environment. And that's how we measure whether or not praxis is occurring. Again, we can separate out that motor skill is a piece of that, but it's not the only piece. So let's now look at how sensation contributes to praxis. So to start with, we'll have a look at how each of the sensory systems contribute to praxis and know that in reality, we cannot separate out um, tactile from visual, from vestibular. It's not, um, it's not a matter of using our senses in isolation, but when we try to quantify what each of the senses is doing, it's helpful to talk about them one, of, one at a time. So to start with, with any motor activity, you typically have a vestibular and a proprioceptive component. So these two systems give us information about force and direction of movements, about a sense of weight and size and force of our body, both at rest and during motion, and a sense of gravity and also our bilateral position. So this contributes to our ability to engage in novel motor activities. In terms of the tactile system, the tactile discrimination piece of the system is particularly important because it gives us information about understanding the boundaries of our body. It gives us refined information about where and how we're moving relative to people and to objects in the environment. It gives us feedback during actions and it helps us to um, to refine and pinpoint the activity that we really want to engage in motorically. If we think about the visual system, we can see what the affordances are in the environment. And affordances basically are qualities of objects or materials or equipment that we may be using when we work with clients um, in any environment. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. We also can use our visual system to interpret the space and what actions will take place. For example, if we're in a very small space, the kinds of actions we might want to engage in would be very different than if we were in an extremely large space. Visual system also contributes to an, this idea of spatial awareness and the sequential ordering of actions. Um, we can also uh, help ourselves um, 
navigate through the space and with the tools and equipment aided by our visual system. And finally, we look to the auditory system. So the auditory system um, also gives us a sense of spatial awareness. So um, where a sound is coming from or where feedback is coming from can be activated through the auditory system. We can also order actions through self-talk. So for example, a child says, first I'm gonna walk over to the monkey bars and then I'm gonna climb the ladder and finally I'm gonna go across them. So this sequential ordering and self-talk can be an aspect of the auditory system helping with praxis. And finally, the auditory system, of course, is implicated in understanding and following unfamiliar directions. Now we're gonna look at a little bit different aspect of praxis and sensation, and that is body scheme and internal maps. And they're both on one slide because they're related to each other. So, what body scheme is, is an, the creation and updating of an unconscious map of our physical body that's stored in our brain. So scheme or schema with an A on the end has to do with um, a set, a web of knowledge. So it's not just one fact that we know or one aspect of our physical body that we can relate to but this kind of web of all of our knowledge about our body that we store in our unconscious brain. We have both sensory and motor maps and schemas, and they're being conscious, uh, continuously updated. So as we engage in new experiences and get that feedback, we're going to be updating the, our body schemas and our internal maps. Schemas help us discriminate sensory information, so tell one sort of sensation from another. It helps us also use sensory information to inform our motor actions. And when we repeat actions, um, our schemas develop over time. So they build and they get more sophisticated as we repeat actions. So in other words, as we practice, our internal schemes and our internal maps get stronger. If we look specifically at the internal maps, uh, first let's take sensory maps. So taking in information and building sensory perceptual memories is the main purpose of a sensory map. So again, we take in information through all of our senses and we build a sensory perceptual memory. So we can, if you think to yourself, I could remember how the sand felt when I was at the beach uh, by the San Francisco Bay. That's a sensory memory, right? A sensory perceptual memory. We can do it with any of our senses, but it's this idea of being able to elicit um, through our memory what sensation was like. We also, um, moving on to motor maps, we build perceptual motor memories of ac action synergies. So in the sensory realm, we build these memories of what sensation is like. And in our motor maps, we build um, memories of perceptual motor activity. We also build action schemas. In other words, um, taking an activity from that phase of motor planning where everything happens has to happen step by step so we really understand it to getting more automated. So as we build motor maps, we can, um, we can make our motor activity more sophisticated and more complex because we're storing the memory and then we can recall it and use it the next time we need it. We also build action chains based on actions that are done together in increasingly complex series of sequences. So not only do we build these action schemas, but we can link schemas together so that if the, um, 
for example, if the motor map is about moving through um, two or three different aspects of um, a, an obstacle course, we get um, those chains of actions. And over time, we know, okay, I have to stand up and go over and under these three first parts of the obstacle course, and then I need to turn my body to the side. So it's this idea of sequencing motor that becomes really important and is a very um, central part of developing motor maps. We also, in terms of sensory and praxis, want to think about environmental exploration. So it's kind of a, um, a very synergistic uh, process where we take in information through our senses as we explore the environment and then we're, move, we're um, motivated to move through the environment so that we can sensorily explore the environment even more. So the process enables us to engage in more functional and intentional motor activity. We're driven by sensation to motor, and then the motor drives us back to um, sensation. And, you know, returning to the roots of ASI, all, all of praxis is aimed towards yielding adaptive responses. So when we work with kids with sensory integration challenges, what we really want to do is see an adaptive response. And if we're thinking about sensory integration therapy, ASI therapy, for kids who have praxis difficulties, the adaptive response is the outcome. And it should be um, also incorporated with our goals for that child so that we know that progress is being made. We can kind of uh, with some kids, get them to verbalize what their um, what their idea is or what their motor plan is. But ultimately, how we know that um, praxis is improving is through observing adaptive responses. So let's turn now to a little bit about um, developmental dyspraxia, which is the absence of um, of strong praxis. So when we think about developmental dyspraxia, one of the hallmarks is that there is no known brain trauma. In other words, it's not any kind of um, brain insult or injury that is causing uh, a child to have dyspraxia. There can be difficulty with learning motor skills, difficulty with learning novel tasks, and also difficulty with generalizing skills that have been learned. So the, the things that I brought up that kind of hallmark praxis are the difficulties that are evident in developmental dyspraxia. We also want to differentiate developmental dyspraxia from motor control deficits. So which would be difficulty planning or organizing actions um, even when motor skills are intact. So when we have difficulty with motor control, again, it may be weakness, it may, it may be a lack of range of motion or um, uh, endurance, but with developmental dyspraxia, it's the difficulty with planning and organizing, even though there's maybe not any weakness or not lack of range of motion or not any kind of neuromotor um, issue that may arise with something like cerebral palsy. So Ayers said the dyspraxic child can and does learn specific motor skills through repeated attempts and executions. But as long as he has not acquired the generalized ability to plan unfamiliar tasks, apraxia is still present. When we look at this, um, we may um, know the, this idea of learning specific 
motor skills through repeated attempts and executions as splinter skills. So you may or may not be familiar with that term, but it's, it's synonymous with what Ayers was talking about. And then she goes on to characterize dyspraxia, which she calls apraxia, and they're, um, they can be used interchangeably. Um, the ability to plan unfamiliar tasks. So again, there's the motor planning and there's the novel sense of the task that, um, that really hallmark developmental dyspraxia. When we think about um, patterns of practice, praxis challenge, um, these are from the um, SIFT. So we have ideational praxis, so coming up with an idea for what you wanna do, visual praxis, being able to see and coordinate your body with your eyes, praxis on verbal command, which would be I say to you, I'd like you to walk over to the corner, get the large orange ball and bring it back and bounce it three times. So there's that aspect of praxis. And then somatopraxis, which has to do with the incorporation of the tactile and proprioceptive systems with motor control and motor coordination for novel activities. If we think about it, Functionally, um, it's very much falls into the same categories, but we think about it with a little bit of a different slant. So for a child with developmental dyspraxia, they may have trouble with initiation, which would be the ideation stage of an activity, but there could also be difficulty initiating a motor act in the execution phase. They may have difficulty using space effectively they might have difficulty with tool use, and that could either be using the body as a tool. In other words, if you, um, if you brace yourself on your knee in order to um, uh, reach up and grab something that's far above your head. Um, so it could be the body as a tool, or it could be tool use, so things that are outside of our body. And a child also might have difficulty with interactions, either with people or with the um, environment. And finally, a child or client might have difficulty with accessing affordances. And again, affordances are the quality of objects or equipment or materials that make them do what they do. So for example, if a child wants to get a um, piece of uh, equipment in the gym and that piece of equipment is unreachable because it's too high. They might have to go and get a step stool. So the step stool has some affordances. It has four legs. It has a certain size, so it needs to be um, in relationship to the storage space where the, where the toy or material is. It may have one or two or three steps, so those are different affordances. And so it's all the qualities about that thing that we call step stool. And hopefully that makes sense. All right, we are um, almost at the end, uh, just to let you know. Okay, so in terms of intervention strategies and functional goals, we have a couple different things going on, and this is actually in your module one as well. So if you want to access it, um, it, it is there as well. Um, when we're working with um, any client, we definitely want to come up with goals, and then we want to strategize how to best um, do intervention. And Katie, I think that I sent you a second um, a second version of this that reversed goals and strategies. So goals came before strategies. Um, so if I didn't, <laughs> my apologies. And if I did, maybe um, maybe upload that one for us um, when you put it when you put it up for others. Okay, so uh, let's come up with goals before we engage in intervention. That's the that's the way of things. So goals could include a, a myriad of different kinds of outcomes, including building body schema, building perceptual awareness, um, 
building a repertoire of action programs or motor skills. So that's a good way to measure um, the outcome of praxis. Problem solving future actions, organization of time or materials, um, increasingly sophisticated motor plans. So we might have a goal that changes over time. The child will kick a stationary ball seven feet. The child will kick a rolled ball. Um, the child will drop a ball and kick it at before it hits the ground, things like that. So we can measure increasing sophistication of, um, of motor activities. We can measure anticipating the need for action. Um, so you get the idea. There's a, there's a wealth of things that we can measure, and we want to be really clear which part of praxis we're actually focused on and, and working to measure. And then in terms of intervention strategies, of course, we're going to, um, you know, we're going to use our professional um, skill and our, and our clinical observation and judgment. But when we intervene, there are some things that can help, like helping a, a client to identify future actions. First, we're going to do this. Second, we're going to do that. Third, we're going to do the other thing. So giving um, giving name to the sequence of activities can be helpful. It can also be helpful to give the child um, sort of a heads up that they are uh, going to be engaging in an activity before they do. And the thing that I do all the time without even thinking about it is saying, okay, one, two, three, go, right? Or ready, set, go. So what we're doing is we're actually setting that child up to anticipate what's coming down the pipe. We can also create visual maps or schedules or reminders to help with um, building praxis. We also um, can have visual tools to help the client understand motor demands. And for many of the, us, especially when working with children with, on the autism spectrum, um, we may use a picture exchange system and it's helpful when we're working on praxis that rather than having an icon that just shows a ball, we have a picture actually of a kid and a ball so that we get the action piece of what we're trying to convey to the child. So there's many different intervention strategies. Those are just a few, but it's something to get you thinking and, um, and, and get you started. And that is uh, the presentation. So now um, you can either unmute your microphone or type questions into the chat box and I'll be happy to address them. I see that Lauren is typing. Are there, so Lauren asks, are there specific areas of the brain that are affected in children with dyspraxia? So that's a, a great and complicated question and it depends on um, where the where the praxis issue is coming from. And that's why I spent so much time breaking it down into ideation, motor planning, execution, feed forward, feedback, right? And looking at the sensory system. So if the child is not, for example, if the child is not getting good tactile discrimination, it would be the associated sensory cortices or some of the spinal tracts if the, if the difficulty is arising lower down, that's, that's the issue. If on the other hand, ideation is the issue, it may be that the child is having some higher level cognitive issues more in the frontal cortex or depending on their age, possibly the prefrontal cortex. Um, if it's motor planning, we also bring in the cerebellum and other aspects of the um, of the motor control systems and the um, and yeah so so the short answer is that it can be widespread and it really depends on what the specific issue is. Does that help? I 
What else are you interested in? Do you have any suggestions for addressing praxis in a school setting? And I'm gonna wait for the second with limited space and materials. <laughs> um, sure, so it depends on whether you're working on gross motor praxis or fine motor praxis. Um, and where we wanna start again is to back up from the intervention, right? So the, the addressing praxis to try to quantify what's going on. So we want to evaluate praxis with an eye to, does that child have difficulty coming up with an idea um, for what they wanna do? Is it the motor planning that's the problem? Is it the execution that's the most challenging or is it the feedback that's really, really hard or a combination? And there's some hallmarks in my experience, and this is by no means the end all, um, but there's some hallmarks of initiation difficulties. And I see it a lot, um, both in school and um, in a clinical setting where if a child's having difficulty with ideation, they will walk into an environment that has kid-friendly things, whether it's in school or clinic or a playground, and they will stand there un uncertain about what to do, right? So that is um, kind of, to my mind, a hallmark of difficulty with, um, with ideation. So we would treat that very differently than uh, difficulty with motor planning. So or execution. So do you have a sense of which aspect of praxis um, you're thinking about? Okay, great. That would be much easier. Can you hear me? I sure can. Great. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So I think, um, you know, in school base, what I see the most is either the kids are, you know, like the they're described as clumsy by their teachers, they're bumping into things, they can't organize their space in the classroom. Um, they're, you know, and then that translates a lot of the times to their handwriting being messy. Um, so I think I just don't always know where to start, I guess, <laughs> is my question, um, when I'm in the school because, you know, just between the demands of the, the school day and having, like this past year, my office was a closet, so not having, yeah, the space and the equipment to be able to do the things that I would like to be able to do, I think is is the challenge. But, um, you know, I think overall that kind of, like I said, the, the kids that are like really clumsy in school and really disorganized okay. is what sure. I'm seeing a lot. Yeah, so we first want to, um, again, make sure that the difficulty is a praxis difficulty as opposed to a motor control difficulty um, or an attentional difficulty or something else going on. So let's assume right. that, um, that we have evaluating, evaluated and we do feel like it is a praxis problem. Um, you know, I work school base, oh gosh, for like 12 years or something. So I, I, I feel your closet and yeah. <laughs> space and materials. Um, as much as is possible, I tend to um, therapeutically start with sensory input. 
Um, and not sitting down, let's put your hands in, um, you know, in, um, that fake Sandy stuff, but actually, um, if you can use a corridor, if you can use outside, if you can use some place that has bigger space, um, even things that require no materials or equipment at all, things like um, wheelbarrow walking, or um, if you do have a scooter board or something like that, um, mm -hmm. I would start with a really big dose of proprioception and active proprioception. Um, and in small places, you can even do like half, and I'm not sure what age kids that you're working with, um, but you can do, you know, like half handstands against the wall or crawling activities, um, something that's going to get a lot of input, a lot of proprioceptive input into the kid's upper extremity if we're thinking about um, preparing for handwriting and also um, some tactile input and some vestibular input. So we're gonna work on self-regulation and, um, and getting to a just right place of alertness and getting a whole bunch of proprioceptive um, input for body awareness, right? So proprioceptive system as well as vestibular system can function to change our uh, regulatory state, right? Or up or down regulate us but also the proprioceptive system in particular gives us an idea of, of where our body is in space. It's also helped by our tactile discrimination system and by our vestibular system. And so I would find a way, even without equipment, to activate that system. I know that um, when I was working school-based, I, um, I went to a discount fabric place and I got like a nine foot uh, length of um, tubing, tube fat fabric. And I would even have kids crawl through that, right? So they're needing to, um, they're needing to make their way against some resistance. They're needing to be on all fours. Um, so that's another activity or animal walks or something like that. So you can't do it in a closet, but you can do <laughs> it with very limited equipment. And starting off with that, it's not to my mind, it's, it's really the, the necessary piece is to prepare the system and then engage in um, a more fine motor handwriting based activity. Um, the clumsiness is a different, uh, a little bit different issue than the handwriting. So if we follow the handwriting piece through, um, it depends on with praxis, it depends to my mind, and, and we've moved into Melissa's opinion here, um, whether or not the child has any cognitive deficits or not. If they do, um, I use a very different set of strategies than if they're cognitively intact or even above average uh, cognition, in which case I will pull into the whole picture um, this idea of talking through what it is that we want to do or making a plan for what we want to do or coming up with five ideas and picking one for what we want to do, right? So we mm -hmm. look at the, um, the ideation, we look at the motor planning, and then we focus on the execution. And are, you're an OT, I'm assuming, yes? Yeah. Yeah. So for us, um, most of us, the execution is really kind of the easiest thing to work on because we work, um, we introduce the activity, we do some variable practice, you know, so, um, so there's a, there can be a motor learning component, but all of the lead up um, is the sensory integration work. And it is recruiting all of the sensory systems, including um, vision and auditory, so that the child can even approach whatever the task is. And that's where that connection between praxis and sensory comes in, right? And it's what differentiates it from, say, if we're working with um, a child with Down syndrome who has super low tone, right? So tone is a neuromotor function. And if they have really low tone, they're going to have difficulty grasping a writing implement. That's just the way it is. And we know that, right? But with our kid with developmental dyspraxia, they don't have um, pathologically low tone, 
they just have trouble with this whole thing called writing. So we do our best to break down um, the activity into ideation, motor planning, execution, feed forward, feedback, and pinpoint the problem, and then put activities in and, and preparation in that will um, help and reinforce with the particular aspect of the task that really is causing the biggest problem. Okay, great. And then just going off of that, um, other than, you know, the clinical observation um, and trying to figure out, um, you know, I'm not SIP certified, are there any um, evaluation tools that or standardized tools that you use to to help you with that process? Sure. So uh, clinical observation um, cannot be, um, you know, the importance cannot be overstated. So um, when you're looking at, at a kid um, to see what the sensory contributions to praxis are, um, it's clinical observation if you're not SIP certified. Um, also uh, getting you know, the sensory profile and the SPM are um, look a lot at reactivity and that in many ways is their main focus. So we're left with looking at um, what a child, how a child engages sensorily with their environment, which is, which is a little bit more difficult. Um, but we can also use tools like um, the Peabody, the BOT2, um, you know, actually our, our motor assessments and we can get some information about praxis, right? So it's not the standardized score in this case that we're looking at, although, you know, we can kind of uh, kill two birds with one stone, but what we're looking at is the quality of movement and how the child approaches the task. And I'll also give a child a less structured task um, for example, uh, one that I love that gives me tons of information is if I have a new toy or a new game that's in a box or even an old one that's in a that's in some sort of container and you have to get it out. Right. So typically there's a picture of this cute thing on the on the lid of the container and you give it to the kid and you go, hey, let's play with this. Right. So we can tell about something about ideation by um, whether or not they show any interest or curiosity or, um, you know, make any comments about it. Yes, I want to play with it. No, I don't. If it's kind of a, a blank response, um, we can further investigate ideation. If they say, yeah, let's do this, and they have absolutely no idea how to get into a container um, and their problem solving strategies are very uh, trial and error and super rote. In other words, they don't learn from their mistakes. So they tried to open it this way and it didn't work. So they just tried harder rather than um, switching up their strategy. And again, you know, there's a lot of other factors. What's their cognition like? What's their um, physical ability like? What age are they at? chronologically and developmentally. So I'm giving you kind of a, a general overview and please understand that it's a general overview, not a uh, prescription for a particular kid. But if they can't approach um, how to get at the toy and their problem solving, sequencing, organization of that process is very difficult, that starts to give me a clue that it's a motor planning issue. If on the other hand, it returns more to they um, they just have difficulty with the motor, with the execution. Then I've kind of gone to a different part of my decision tree where I say to myself, well, is this a motor issue? Is it tonal in nature? Is it, um, is it weakness? Is it um, a musculoskeletal issue? Is it a neuromotor problem? Um, is it something that falls in the realm of more kind of the hardcore motor, or do I suspect that there's a sensory component? Am I seeing that this kid has really poor bilateral integration, which to me signals vestibular issue? Or am I seeing that the child um, just is, you know, like you said, is bumping and, um, and stumbling all over everything, and that's his problem, and 
perhaps it's a proprioceptive or a somatosensory issue rather than a motor issue. So it does take a lot of kind of um, investigation and uh, really digging into what is this? What is the problem? And our motor tests can give us that information, but we need to look at them in terms of what is the activity and what are the, what are the kind of more qualitative observations that we can make. And then, as I said, I also do um, a less structured activity. Does that help? Yes, thank you so much. That helps a lot. Sure. So um, Maria um, says, provided that a child has problems with sensory modulation, for example, several types of sensation, he is probably having issues with praxis, question mark. In this way, at first, we should think about his level of self-regulation, setting our goals of intervention. That's an awesome question. Um, and we can see kids who have praxis issues without any kind of modulation issues. We can see kids that have modulation issues and they have great praxis. And we can see kids that have both going on. And then of course there's kids that are typical and they have neither going on. But um, it doesn't necessarily, uh, if you have praxis issues, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have modulation issues. And in fact, you know, when Ayers, um, was doing her early work and when she was first um, standardizing the SIFT, she, well, this is my understanding from talking with Zoe and Suzanne at length and, and my own study is that initially she was seeing modulation issues and over and under reactivity. And then she set that aside um, in favor of, more, of focusing more on the praxis issues. And the SIFT actually is standardized on a pretty narrow population of kids that primarily have praxis issues and don't have a lot of sensory modulation issues. And one of the, you know, one of the challenges in, in using the SIPT, like say with our, you know, ever um, exploding population of kids on the autism spectrum is that they have modulation issues as well as praxis issues. So we can, we can see all different combinations. Um, and I'm just going to reread your question. Um, so the last part of your question, um, should we first think about uh, his level of self-regulation, setting our goals of intervention? Absolutely, because if we have a, a client that has sensory modulation issues and praxis issues, if we don't work with the modulation and getting that child into a just right state of arousal or alertness, then his or her ability to approach tasks that require um, praxis and building praxis is going to be that much harder, right? So our kids that have sensory modulation issues may be the ones that fly from one activity to another and they never stick with anything. They have difficulty with persistence, um, sometimes with attention. So when we think about um, what are our first goals, it's, it's most definitely if a child has both praxis and modulation issues, we want to look at the modulation and then uh, we don't want to stop there, right? So we get this kid into a just right state for learning um, and that's not a sufficient end goal. So when I write goals, um, I write goals that actually have a functional outcome. So I would not write a goal that says, um, you know, uh, Susie will, um, will uh, calm herself sufficiently for uh, the 30 minutes that she's in OT. That doesn't have any functional outcome. So what I would look at is um, Susie will be able to participate in 30 minutes of whatever activity it is that we want her to participate in. And my method of treatment, my intervention would be getting her modulated and then 
addressing the activity, whether it was, uh, you know, drawing a picture, writing her name, um, whatever the activity is. So we want to differentiate between um, the functional outcome, which belongs in the goal, and our means for getting there. So our method of intervention, which at the end of the day, nobody kind of cares how we got Susie to write her name. They just care whether or not she could do it. And that's kind of the sad truth. So for your clinical reasoning, you definitely want to, um, to, to put that into your treatment plan, but as an outcome measure, you may not include it. It may simply be the outcome. Does that help? Sure, yeah. Um, well, we have a few minutes left. I could um, uh, answer one more question. As you can tell, I'm a little bit long-winded, but I'll try to be brief. And if you would all um, just let me know where you're from, um, that just is kind of thrilling to me to talk to, um, to um, SI folks from all over. So thanks, Sue. Um, so um, Maria asks, you mentioned that we could teach a child some skills and he or she will learn how to do it, but dyspraxia will remain. Why can praxis not be improved as function according to all knowledge about neuroplasticity? Sure. So um, we can teach, uh, I want to differentiate between this idea of, of splinter skills right, which is getting a child to simply repeat an activity over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until they can do it. And uh, shoe tying is kind of a sophisticated activity, but one that um, because it's so important in some instances for that child to be able to be independent, we teach him to tie his shoes, but he can't do anything else that, that is at that level of sophistication. Um, that's a splinter skill. But when we're um, working on praxis, you know, it's a continuum. Um, there's going to be um, there's going to be some dyspraxia that remains in many cases. We don't know why because we don't know why it happened in the first place. But I do believe that we can improve dyspraxia um, through uh, air sensory integration as well as um, other treatment techniques that help support that child and, um, and foster neuroplasticity. So I think that the, that the quality and the level of impairment um, due to dyspraxia can improve. And in many cases, you know, it, it's like um, ki kids who are clumsy um, can learn a lot of stuff and become less clumsy. Um, but they're not going to be an Olympic athlete by the time they're, you know, 18 or 22 years old, or like I'm watching the World Cup right now, like they're not going to go to the World Cup, right? So what we're looking for is kind of like on a continuum that that child improves and improves across the board. And if you recall, I mentioned, you know, some of the outcomes are the ability to generalize what he or she learned to another situation or in another environment or a slightly different set of equipment and or tools. And so we can see gains there um, that are in fact due to neuroplasticity, due to improving one's ability to um, create um, internal schemas and uh, sensory and motor maps. So we can see improvement um, but in many cases, it's not going to be an issue of the dyspraxia disappearing altogether. You're very welcome. Uh, well, it's 630, and I am happy to uh, stick around for a few minutes if you have other questions, but I want to be respectful of your time, and I really appreciate you uh, attending the session. And we will be uh, coming up with a July date. And as I said at the beginning, it will focus on the reactivity or modulation aspect 
of uh, ASI theory. You are so welcome, everyone. Thank you so much.